Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for an insightful panel discussion on RBI master direction on digital payment security control. Before moving ahead, few housekeeping items to be noted. Today's panel discussion will last for 90 minutes, including Q&A session. All the attendees will be in listen only mode. We will have Q&A session after the panel discussion. If you have any questions, you can also put it in the question window located on your screen. Introducing our today's moderator, Mr. Darshan Shantamurti. Darshan Shantamurti is the founder and CEO of CISA. With more than two decades of experience, he is mission to protect businesses from cyber criminals. He works closely with CXOs of businesses to draw their cybersecurity strategy and improve their security posture. A pioneer in payment security space, he's, he is the first payment security assessor in Asia and been core for payment forensic investigator. Welcome, Darshan. Darshan, I would like you to uh, I, I would like to you to request and uh, introduce our esteemed panelist. Over to you, Darshan. Thanks, Ashwini. Uh, very good afternoon to all. Uh, good morning to people who have joined from. Uh, other uh, good, uh, good morning and good evening to our people who have joined from uh, other parts of the world. Uh, it's a pleasure uh, to be here uh, in between all of you uh, today for this uh, highly impactful uh, panel discussion on the RBI's uh, uh, master directive. Uh, so it'll be I'm uh, eagerly looking forward to having this conversation and uh, uh, looking forward to all the questions that uh, many of you have already sent and, and, and try to keep it as interactive as possible. Uh, today, I've got an esteemed panel. Um, to start with, uh, we've got uh, Rajiv Kumar, uh, who's the, uh, you know, who's from MasterCard. Uh, Rajiv has a strong, uh, uh, you know, banking and financial services experience. He's uh, spearheading MasterCard's risk management uh, for long years now. I've uh, known him uh, for uh, many years, and I'm sure he's going to be uh, very useful for this panel uh, to give uh, more insight from the uh, fraud and risk management standpoint. There's a lot of uh, uh, content around uh, that piece in the RBI, you know, RBI directive. Uh, so, so hopefully, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, questions around fraud and risk management, uh, Rajiv uh, will be able to, um, you know, uh, help us uh, navigate to those questions. Um, the next is, of course, Rajesh. Uh, uh, Rajesh is uh, from uh, Paytm Bank. He's the CISO. Uh, Rajesh is a veteran uh, cybersecurity professional. Um, uh, you know, he's um, he's been in the thick and thin of uh, uh, cybersecurity from a, a financial services provider. Uh, so we are very uh, happy to have him as part of this panel discussion. Uh, as we all know, that regulated entities are uh, uh, are uh, covered very well in this uh, uh, directive, so he would bring in that perspective uh, as to how uh, regulated entities should look up, uh, and especially uh, payment banks, which has been covered uh, in this uh, gu guideline as well. Uh, how uh, you know they should actually be looking at it uh, and uh, implementing. So he would uh, bring the stakeholder, the implementer perspective uh, about this uh, directive. The next is uh, uh, Nitin Bhatnagar. Uh, Nitin uh, is a, uh, you know, we all know that uh, he's been spearheading the PCI Security Standards Council's initiatives in India. Uh, he's been uh, a flag bearer for the standards uh, uh, for the uh, for the for the council, uh, and uh, he's uh, you know, uh, quite popular uh, in terms of uh, putting across his viewpoints and working for the advocacy of the standards and implementation of the standards uh, in the country and uh, uh, other parts of uh, Southeast Asia as well. So we're very glad to have Nitin give his perspective uh, in this. One of the uh, key things that has been covered in this directive is a lot on how standards should be implemented. So he would bring in the standards perspective uh, on the on how standards should be looked at and uh, how it should be uh, uh, you know, uh, kind of implemented and regarded uh, in the entire uh, as we move forward from this uh, state. Uh, the next, uh, we've got Yogesh Patel, uh, who's my, uh, uh, you know, who's my colleague at CISA. He uh, leads uh, uh, our uh, forensics investigations. Uh, he's been a, co he's, a, he's a court PFI, a court payment forensic investigator, one of the most coveted uh, uh, forensic uh, 
you know accreditations that's available uh, is a sans uh, 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 gi uh, is certified on forensics and he leads a forensics practice he leads a team so every day he basically in, is between uh, investigations something which is quite unusual for uh, people is quite uh, normal for him uh, so we just pulled him managed to pull him from a couple of investigations today hopefully they are in safe hands but uh, yogesh is between us to share his perspective of how uh, uh, forensics uh, you know what can we learn from those forensic investigations and implement and how does how does that get married with compliance uh, at the end of the day uh, with this rbi directive so so quite a, uh, a strong uh, panel today that we've got um, the the next is so so what's our key objective of this panel discussion um, so we want to keep it as uh, uh, simple as it can get uh, to give insights on the rbi master circular uh, so so what is it uh, we want to uh, we've already started getting a lot of questions from all of you uh, in fact we are quite overwhelmed with those questions we'll try to cover as much as possible uh, but in case we get to answer those questions much earlier we can uh, you know we can uh, take those questions and you can feel free to post all your questions on this uh, as ashwini said on the chat window uh, we will uh, make it a point to answer it during this session if we can't for some reason uh, either we need to get back and uh, you know get uh, expert advice uh, inside cisa we would do that uh, and then we'll revert back to you but um, as much as possible we will try to give you an answer today uh, and hopefully we should be uh, uh, we want to create as much value to uh, to your organization and to yourself uh, uh, today in this the next uh, 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 you know 80, 80, 80 minutes that we have got with us uh with that uh, just a quick check uh, do we have uh, all the panelists here or uh, are we missing anyone uh, i see rajiv here rajiv are you there it's a quick check hey darshan hi yes okay all right excellent so we've got uh, both rajiv and uh, rajesh uh, also on the panel uh, today so excellent uh, welcome to all of you uh, we are very excited uh, 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 you know, uh, Rajiv, Rajesh, Nitin, Yogesh, uh, thanks for uh, your valuable uh, time today. Uh, we are all excited. I'm sure the <clears throat> the audience today, uh, the, uh, the participants will take home uh, some useful uh, uh, notes from your experience and from your perspective. Uh, and of course, we don't claim to be experts here in this group. Uh, we, uh, you know, as, as someone said on the panel, we are all learning. Uh, so we also intend to learn from you uh, that's our selfish motive so for uh, all your all uh, people who participate in, in these kinds of webinars we have learned a lot from you guys so keep uh, keep those questions coming at our side uh, we will try our best to answer them if we can uh, and if we can't then we will let you know at a later point in time uh, we'll come back to you with those answers after checking inside excellent so with that um, i would quickly uh, uh, you know start this uh, you know, quick start the panel uh, with probably getting some opening remarks uh, from each of uh, the uh, panelists out here uh, in terms of a quick, uh, you know, 30, 60 second, uh, you know, uh, maybe 60 seconds, uh, a minute uh, in terms of what you think, um, you know, what's your overall feel of this particular uh, circular, uh, you know, so how is it going to be different? Some, you know, a 60 second check, uh, uh, you know, 60 second comment on. Uh, this master circular so i would probably start with uh, uh, you know with uh, rajiv uh, if rajiv if you want to give a 60 second uh, comment on your on this master circular what you think about it and then we'll go around uh, and, and then get everyone's viewpoints sure uh thank you Darshan and csr team uh, thanks for having me and it's a pleasure to be you know connecting with you all um yeah my quick take on this i i look at this as a big uh, step forward uh, or a big initiative you know that uh, the regulator has taken as usual as always uh, they've been proactive in driving uh, safety and security you know in the indian you know, market so I, I see there's a big initiative um, and uh, you know, in, in driving the, the safety and security. Um, and and, and the, 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 uh, we know that there are many other directions and advisories that we have seen from RBI in the past. Uh, the key difference that I see with this master circular, which, uh, which is a very comprehensive and robust uh, you know, guidelines 
that not only covers uh, the cyber security uh, area, uh, but it also covers the various aspects of risk management, uh, fraud risk, transaction monitoring, uh, you know, compliance. Um, it talks about um, the application level security. It, it's a very, very comprehensive uh, you know, direction. Um, I, I believe it provides uh, a clear direction for the regulated entities. Um, and I also believe this this is something uh, was prepared uh, now based on uh, the uh, the experience that uh, that the RBS team has gained uh, in 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 reviewing or investigating the the incidents reported in India. So yeah, I, I'm I'm very positive about this direction, and then hopefully uh, the regulator entities take uh, the this direction very seriously and and implement the guidelines from the RBI. Thanks, Rajiv. Uh, so, so, Nitin, uh, what is your take? Uh, um, you know, yeah. Yeah, I, I would just add on to what uh, what Rajiv just said. You know, I think uh, these uh, Nitin, I think we just lost you for a second uh okay till till nitin is back uh from yeah. potentially uh, uh, so nitin are you there okay he just uh, lost you, you. we can hear okay. you now yeah okay go ahead I, go ahead I, I, I go, I'll, I'll just repeat for the for the interest of the audience is that what i was trying to say is that just to build on what rajiv just highlighted you know see if you see the country has uh, become an increasingly attractive target for the cyber criminals and the security of the cardholder data uh, must be one of the top priority for everyone today. And in order to accomplish or in order to uh, get the stronger payment security involves your global collaboration and the organizations here, whoever is there on the call should start prioritizing data security as an important element to their day to day business activities. And most importantly, after uh, the directions that we see now uh, from the Reserve Bank of India, investing in the cyber security and getting your employees trained on the pci standards and improving on cyber hygiene will definitely help the industry take steps in the right direction thanks Ajit. rajesh do you want to add to that yeah i think uh, so nitin and rajiv has covered almost uh, but i i just add to the uh, point which basically you know so i think if you if you ask me after um, cyber security framework in 2016 this is a major uh, you know uh, enhancement from uh, whatever cyber security framework in 2016 was introduced uh, so it comprehensively covers the whole uh, digital ecosystem uh, of the bank, current banks. And considering uh, the COVID has basically only accelerated the whole digital adoption in the banks. So I see that is a, you know, <clears throat> Uh, uh they have they have covered like they have covered the fraud management they have covered the overall uh, dispute management as well also as part of uh, this circular so they are trying to cover the whole ecosystem of the uh, whole ecosystem considering earlier the other channels like uh, you know branches and all that were there where people used to go and then complain about it but in this they have covered even that dispute resolution and all that also through the digital channels so that's i think is a, another enhancement apart from so confidentiality integrity and availability they have looked at the fraud they have looked at the um, the dispute resolution they have looked at the uh, overall uh, settlement system as well also so if you see that it covers the whole uh, whole 360 degree of the uh, payment system uh, payment in the uh, uh, in the banks Excellent. Uh, thanks. Yogesh, any, uh, from a forensic investigation standpoint, how do you see this? Uh, you know, what's your take uh, from a forensic investigator standpoint? Are you happy or are you disappointed? Uh, I'm, I'm actually happy with the uh, directions which I mentioned, uh, to be precise, because it, it covers a lot of controls. If those are implemented properly, it is going to reduce the number of breaches or say uh, uh, the volume or the impact of the breach as well. Uh, looking at the controls we, we have seen these controls implemented here and there partially but you know with this directive coming into play uh, at least we can uh, ensure that all the controls would be implemented uniformly 
and uh, you know uh, we we would be seeing these all things uh, coming in picture talking from the controls itself uh, they they are really great and uh, they should address uh, most of the risk uh, which which we foresee or say we, which we are currently seeing in the market in all the breaches which we have investigated we we have seen certain controls which is mentioned on the say the document which are missing due to which the entity got breach so it's it's good to see that these are addressed excellent yeah so uh, you know i subscribe to the view of all the panelists uh, here uh, i think it's a step in the direction a step in the right direction uh, so one of the good things is uh, i think it's by far one of the uh, very prescriptive um, uh, you know directive that has come from the regulator uh, uh, you know so far whatever we have seen has been a little uh, I, I think uh, uh, subjective so if i were to use that word liberally here uh, uh, but this one is very very well uh, positioned uh, and, and give specific pointers uh, on what organization should do. So, uh, it, it, you know, really excited to talk on specifics as we move forward. Uh, with that, uh, you know, from the participants uh, standpoint, uh, quickly, if you can run a sh short poll in terms of uh, identifying um, what you think about this directive. Uh, Ashwini, if you don't mind pulling up a, that uh, the first poll and, and getting participants viewpoint so that we can also here get uh, perspective so we've got the question here on your screen uh, probably about 60 seconds if you uh, if you can uh, please help us understand um, uh, what do you think uh, which regulated entities are covered in this latest uh, master direction um, so uh, you know so it'd be it would be good to know um, how many of us uh, uh, feel that it is applicable to which kind of entities so it would be nice to Just give it another 15 seconds and then we'll close the poll. So I'd request everyone to vote. Uh, so we've got about 15 seconds left. So go ahead and make your choices. Okay, so we kind of uh, closed the poll. Um, I mean, most of you have got it. Um, uh, you know, the 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 answer to that is uh, actually all the first four options, right? So if you look at that's the first uh, uh, in the first page of the master direction, uh, it says these provisions shall apply to all the following regulated entities, which includes uh, scheduled commercial banks, uh, small finance banks payment banks and credit card issuing NB nbfc so so that's one i think very powerful uh, component of this uh, direction is that it covers uh, pretty much and, and clarifies where all it covers and uh, uh, so they've included small finance banks unlike uh, you know other uh, circulars which kind of uh, sometimes may or may not apply and then the payment banks which is uh, very very uh, important because as we all know rbi has issued a lot of payment bank licenses so it includes payment banks and, of course, credit card issuing NBFC. So, uh, pretty, uh, pretty uh, clear in terms of who it it applies to. Excellent. So, with that, I think we should um, uh, open up uh, the, the. You know, I, I can start with uh, you know, uh, pulling um, uh, you know those questions out that we've got for all the panels here, uh, and then uh, as I mentioned, uh, please feel free to ask questions on the on the uh, on this uh, go to webinar uh, panel um, we will try to mix it up uh, with your questions with the questions that i have got so that we keep it as interactive as possible uh, as i mentioned this is a forum for all of us to engage interact uh, learn and uh, you know get a little bit more uh, knowledgeable about the circular at the end of the session so with that um, i would start with uh, uh, you know with rajiv the first question would be uh, you know the applicability right so we spoke about the applicability of the regulated entities uh, you know rajiv from uh, mastercard could probably talk about how does this apply to service providers uh, who partner with banks uh, or provide service to them um, you know from a compliance standpoint so uh, how would it um, who 
you know say for example i am uh, i am a service provider who is dealing with a, a scheduled bank uh, will this directive apply to me or uh, is it uh, something that i can ignore this directive rajiv your thoughts thanks doshan um yeah let's if you look at uh, the details of this direction um uh, though it says it applies for the regulated entities it also mentions that uh, regulated entities should have a full oversight uh, you know, on the service providers uh, you know, who are you know, supporting the regulated entities so in that sense i believe it it if it applies for the regulated entity and if the regulated entities outsource their services to a third party uh, it it may apply for the third parties as well and in addition there are other directions from R- rbi uh, that specifically talks about the, the guidelines for uh, let's say payment aggregators or or payment gateways uh, which talks about you know compliance with the pci standards and other regulations so i think we have to read all this together and uh, and and if you ask me a simple answer does it apply to the regulate uh, regulated entities and their service providers uh, i i believe so because it, it it talks about having an oversight and ensuring that the uh, service providers also comply with the standards so so in my opinion yes I, i i believe it may not fully apply all the controls may not apply but whatever they have outsourced if it is related to a banking activity i think it will apply sure excellent uh, anyone else has anything to comment um, uh, rajesh do you want to actually add anything to this yeah so uh, so i think yeah, nah, as rajiv clearly mentioned so nah, and i was earlier nah, alluding that as well so it's the whole ecosystem including all third parties and the vendors where we outsource and knowing the banks currently you know almost 60 70% of your work is actually done by the partners you know, right so um, so that they basically applies to all of them if you read through the uh, between the lines uh, although the uh, uh, as a standard rbi always says that you know the overall responsibility is with the bank am i right so even though whatever you have outsourced the overall responsibility is with now uh, will remain with the bank itself so yeah it does apply all those controls also does apply fantastic thank you for that uh, i think that was uh, a good uh, you know uh, take on uh, the applicability because that's the first question that we keep getting from a lot of uh, uh, you know lots of our customers as well who is it applicable is it not applicable to me because i i am not listed there so that kind of answers that question the second question I'll, that uh, I, yeah i'll just go ahead the question here is on yeah. the, the if you talk about the payment card industry so we all have to understand the ecosystem well right and 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 the standards also talks about you know when you talk about the payment card industry data security standards they talked about this the security of the payment card data or the or the or the card holder data now any entity that stores in general or process and or transmits the card holder data would look for the standards of pci now let me let me also try to for the audience interest let me clarify something that you know pci is just not about pci dss just as one of the one stand alone standard today pci security standard council has 15 data security standards and and that's where out of those 15 data security standards you can see some of them uh, listed in the document which uh, which was published which is published by rbi right so so which we will discuss in in the in the course of the session but i just wanted to make sure that everybody understands that uh, when we talk about the applicability uh, if you are storing processing and or transmitting card holder data i think it, the best practices that you should follow is uh to look for the pci standards so that you know you, you are able to secure the payment data sure so nitin uh, just to take uh, you know take forward that uh, point on the standards uh, you know I, i'm just moving to the risk assessment standpoint uh, you know uh, you know we've been working on risk assessment for long uh, and, and it's happening to note that um, you know uh, point 8 of the rbi uh, uh, master direction talks about Uh, conducting risk assessments uh, for uh, you know to to ensure uh, safety and security of digital payment products uh, they talk about and uh, it kind of gives a pretty holistic uh, and prescriptive directive i think there are some points up, up to 12 uh, aspects which needs to get covered uh, so your take uh, because i know that uh, pci dss uh, you know uh, risk assessment has uh, prescribed you know octave iso 27005 and nist sp 830 
So uh, how do you map this? Uh, can organizations use uh, those uh, risk assessment methodology to to meet this uh, direct you know point eight of this di directive? No, I think. See, I, I mean, I think. Thanks for that question, Darshan. Uh, I, mean, I know you have been 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 the master on the risk assessment already because you you are part of one of the the paper. You know, the guidance that PCI published way back in two thousand twelve. So, so you know, I, you know, if I miss something, probably you can you can add on to it, or probably Yogesh can add on to it, or other panelists. But the risk assessment process, you know, as a whole, if you have to understand, should include uh, the people, process, and the technologies. You know, that are involved in the uh, overall storage processing and transmission of the cardholder data including that may not be directly involved in the processing of the uh, of the cardholder data and, uh, you know but still have the potential to impact the security of the cardholder data environment you know for for example we all know the uh, the parameter building security at the facility where the cde which is a cardholder data environment is located consideration should also be given to business processes uh, that are outsourced and or managed by the third party service providers or the merchants. So in a nutshell, if you have to take the risk management uh, perspective strategy, I think this is one thing uh, that you should look at uh, or the, the companies uh, here on the call today or in this webinar should start looking into it. And to ensure there is an adequate coverage, uh, an organization wide risk assessment or the risk management program would uh, need to ensure that the risk across all areas of the organization are considered. That is, uh, yeah, no, that is, uh, that's, that's there is a is a coordinated strategy for addressing the identified, uh, you know, risks and the risk mitigation efforts are also aligned to the should also be aligned to the business processes. So, so that is what I would uh, I would try to bring across, uh, you know, when you talk about the risk management strategy or uh, uh, which everyone should start looking at. And I think ISO twenty seven thousand. Uh, five and octave methodologies are, are been been there has been part of the PCI standards and it's been referenced uh, you know well uh, and, and you know better Dushan I think you, you have been working on this uh, and you are you are a subject matter expert on the octave itself. Sure, sure. So so yeah, just to add to I think you covered it pretty much. Just to add to that, I, I think um, uh, one of the key things that uh, you know what I would uh, I I would see uh, like to see organizations do that is to do uh, as you said. A proper uh, formal risk assessment for across all their digital payment uh, products, uh, and uh, I mean I'm just quoting the RBI uh, direction here. It says uh, security of digital payment products and associated processes and services. So I, I would I, you know I, I believe that one should actually do a proper formal risk assessment across all the digital products, um, which includes all form factors of uh, digital payments and not just one form factor of digital payments because I think all digital payments have uh, uh, their risks associated, and I think one of the key things that I see, uh, maybe we we are not emphasizing so much, is on alternate form factors of payments, uh, not just cards, but uh, other form factors like the UPI, um, the SWIFT, or the RTGS, the NEFT, the uh, you know all the uh, all the other digital uh, payment form factors. So, uh, so I, I, that's my take on uh, the point eight of the RBI master direction, uh, which talks about. Uh, you know, ability uh, conducting risk assessments. Excellent. Uh, anyone else wants to add to that? Uh, feel free uh, just to. All right. Uh, okay. Fair enough. I, I'll move forward. Uh, moving forward, uh, the next, I, I'm going for the benefit of the uh, uh, participants here. Uh, you know, if you have the master circular, you can open up that master circular. Uh, we are going in flow uh, point by point just to make sure that we have covered uh, everything and wherever we, we find that uh, it requires some discussion so that we we, we are able to get some clarity. Uh, those are the points that I've kind of highlighted and I'm asking the panelists. But if you have any questions uh, as you read that RBI directive, feel free to put it in the questions window uh, and we will uh, make an attempt to answer that as well. Uh, so the point 24 to 27, I think that's uh, uh, quite an interesting uh, point that has come in. I know that uh, we've been advocating that for a very, very long time. But uh, once again, very heartening to note that uh, some of these things have actually uh, been uh, put out in the, uh, in, the, uh, in the direction as well. In fact, uh, I, I see that uh, you know, our, our teams have also put up our, our CISA top five uh, learnings for forensic investigations. And one of the, um, uh, you know, the first, I think, first learning, if I'm not mistaken, is 
talks about uh, frequent patching and making sure vulnerability assessments are done because I think uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, breaches. I, I think many of the breaches uh, have happened because of that. Uh, I'm tempted to answer that, but I would I would let Yogesh go and give a, a, a you know a, 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 you know the first two cents about that vulnerability assessments and what uh, the direction covers, and then I'll request Rajesh to add on top of it. Yogesh. Sure. Thank you, uh, Darshan. So, uh, talking about the vulnerability assessment today, uh, we see that most of the organization use vulnerability assessment scans to determine what patches are missing in their environment, and based on whatever is identified, go ahead and uh, you know apply the patches to that. In our breach investigations, we have seen that most, or say almost all of the entities, though they were following this process. Uh, the scans which they was doing was non-credentials, non-credential based scan, which generally just relies on the say header which is received from the uh, system and just uh, identifies the uh, you know uh, the one based on the header. The information which is received might be correct, might be incorrect as well, and also it does not enumerate all the applications or the vulnerabilities uh, which are present in the system. The application patch might be missing. The application which is installed might be vulnerable, or the operating system which is uh, which is running uh, might have missing patches as well. Uh, so uh, this is what uh, I see uh, is addressed now. Uh, it it uh, the standard is uh, I mean the directive advocates of uh, conducting a credential based vulnerability assessment scans. This was uh, this would essentially uh, you know be, uh, due to this all the say missing patches or the vulnerabilities uh, could be identified accurately without uh, much of false positive. And then the necessary steps could be taken to remediate these vulnerabilities. Uh, in our uh, breach investigation, we have seen these kind of uh, vulnerabilities being exploited to say to gain the initial uh, access, that is what we call as ingress point, or to gain the initial access of the environment or to perform the lateral movements, that is, from movement from one system to another system uh, in a compromised environment. So with this, we'll be a, uh, able to, you know, address those kind of issues. Right. Yeah, Yogesh. So I, I think Yogesh, you are referring to point twenty-seven for those of the for the benefit of the participants uh, on this uh, uh, on this webinar. Uh, I think point twenty-seven is what you are talking about, which says vulnerability scanning uh, to be performed on authenticated mode. Uh, is what uh, so one of the key things uh, that we have also seen uh, you know you obviously get a lot of vulnerabilities when you run with authenticated uh, in an authenticated mode and uh, i think the purpose of this point by the rbi is to make sure that you have fixed all the vulnerabilities and um, you know to stop the uh, to at least reduce the uh, ingress uh, 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 you know uh, capability of uh, of the intruder uh, the, you know, Rajesh, you want to uh, quickly uh, talk about, uh, add to whatever Yogesh said, uh, what do you think about this vulnerability assessment? Uh, you know, uh, what's your take? Correct. So it, um, it comprehensively covers the whole uh, process of vulnerability assessment, penetration and testing, and the source code as well also. So if you, if you see this, uh, specifically the 24th point talks about uh, primarily that even if the uh, source code in, in a <clears throat> Most of the bank's case, your CBS um, definitely was something which uh, uh, some one of the uh, top three players or top four um, uh, CBS players has it, right? So now it says that even if the source code is um, uh, not developed or done by the RE, they have to ensure that the uh, you know they get some sort of a certificate from the uh, uh, the vendor who has developed the source code that it is uh, it is free from any bugs or it is free from any backdoors and all that as well also so that's uh, a key thing there and then um, it uh, and then it goes and goes into detail of you know uh, that all the VAs has to be uh, done at least half yearly, and the PT has to be done yearly. I, uh, the important bit, I think, which uh, which was not there uh, even in the CSF, although VA VAPT was covered even in the CSF. The important thing which I saw in, uh, is covered here is the panel provisions. So they are saying that you have to have the panel provisions also included in your contracts with the uh, all the vendors uh, there. So which is which is again uh, basically you are putting in penalty clause and all that also uh, for vendors so that's something uh, I'm not sure how exactly it's going to be 
taken by the uh, some of the suppliers but that something is uh, very important uh, the again in the uh, in the 25th point it basically talks about you know automated scans and all that has to be done on all your uh, public facing and customer sensitive data on a continuous and more frequent basis so although at, at this moment it says more frequent basis but it doesn't say what is more free, what is the frequency and all that but uh, knowing that uh, you know it's a, uh, the expectation would be maybe at least on a quarterly or something uh, has to be performed um, the other important bit i think which i saw which was the maybe a bit differentiated from a last one is that so it basically ask you to compare the results of your earlier scans with the new scans in 26th point it says that you have to compare those um, uh, compare them and then uh, confirm the patching and then it uh, basically wanted to have that whole uh, you know the overall governance process as well also so it says that if you have um, you know any of those which are maybe some of the because of business reason you can't patch those then you have to have those residual risks some sort of a documented there and it has to be accepted and all that so there has to be a overall governance um for that and all the vulnerabilities which are there in the system and the bank and board should be aware that these are the vulnerabilities and they have to maybe because of the whatever the inherent uh, inherent uh, dependency on the system or the uh, or the software they have to accept that risk and document as well also which is again com com complete uh, completely covering the um, all the three, uh, 360 degree of the vapt process yeah, excellent. I, I think that's a uh, that's a that's a master stroke. I think uh, one of the key things we were, uh, you know, during my audit, uh, you know, experience, we've seen many people check the box on this. So when they did yeah. vulnerability assessment, they would do vulnerability assessments, and but they would not really go and fix those vulnerabilities. Uh, but Correct. so so because at the end of the day, the, com the the standard essentially said you have to do vulnerability assessments, but nowhere says it says that you need to mitigate them. Correct. <laughs> so, Correct. Uh, so, so just adding adding to your point, you're absolutely bang on. I think the governance portion is uh, something that um, uh, you know is, is covered very very well. Uh, of course, the frequency I think they have kept it half yearly, while we know the yeah. standards uh, talks about quarterly. But I think it's largely Correct. considering the banks that you know the banks because it's going to be applicable to large banks, uh, and yeah. they would have uh, you know a challenge with respect to patching uh, frequently. So they've kind of at least kept it half yearly so that people can. Uh, uh, you know, follow that. So I think uh, considering uh, that part, but uh, I think all of us ideally we know. Uh, maybe Yogesh can add that in, a, in in the case of Equifax breach. Uh, I think the the breach essentially happened. Uh, uh, you know, in, in probably in a vulnerability that was, uh, you know, which was identified and uh, reported by the vendor, and there was a, uh, you know, there was a. Uh, exploit open uh, much 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 sooner so a three month patch cycle also is ineffective in some sense uh Jokesh, do you want to uh, quickly comment on that the patch cycle yeah Darshan, that's that's correct so uh, we have seen many cases where you know uh, uh, the entity get exploited because uh, the you know the though the vulnerability was released and the exploit code was available just soon after the uh, vulnerability was released. And the uh, those patches are there, but the, because the patch cycle is like three to six months, so the patch was not deployed. And due to which uh, there was a, a breach as well. We have seen that uh, with the critical Citrix vulnerabilities as well, uh, getting exploited uh, on the public facing uh, domains. Uh, many ransomware cases as well, which has led, uh, which has been recorded with such things. Okay, so we're getting a lot of questions, um, uh, and I'm tempted to start asking. I know, uh, kind of uh, uh, trying to answer some of them here. Uh, I, I'll try to mix it up just to make sure that uh, we get as many questions. I see a lot of questions here. Uh, you know, it's great that everyone is asking that. Uh, so, uh, so the first question is uh, maybe this is to Rajiv. Uh, that you know, uh, do you think this includes payment aggregators also, Rajiv? Uh, uh, because I think there's one question uh, which we have got from uh, uh, from uh, the participant, uh, uh, you know, Raj Agarwal, uh, which says that this, this includes payment aggregator also. The RBI released a uh, different uh, no, guidelines for uh, payment aggregators and uh, payment gateways uh, that was announced, uh, I believe, in March uh, 2020 and later updated in November. 
um, but but res respect to this particular master direction uh, they did not specifically mention anything about uh, the payment aggregators or, or payment gateways uh, but considering this is on the entire uh, business of the regulated entities and if the regulated entities outsource it to the payment aggregators I believe it may apply for the payment aggregators as well. Right. Yeah. Just while we answer this, this is our personal take of it. Uh, so. Uh, yeah. Our, uh, yeah. So so only the regulator could essentially clarify that. But I think. Uh, yeah. So so yeah. So but appreciate that, Rajiv. I think you've given a fantastic uh, you know uh, attempt and you know perspective to this. Thank you. Yeah, just to add it because all the, the standards related to data security and uh, now which you can see some level of an um, an um, an um, thing uh, which was already covered in the PAPG guidelines released by RBI. Um, if we look at PA PCIDSs or PADSs or any data security related uh, compliance. Uh, so in the master direction, though it clearly says it is only for the regulated entities. Uh, but if you look at the, you know, the guidelines for the payment aggregators, so that was separately covered in a different guideline or advisory from the RBI. Yeah, the question is very specific to uh, the only this direction, which 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 covers different aspects of risk management. Um, so so we, we we know we believe it it applies, but again, as you mentioned, like you know, RBI is the authorized. Uh, uh, no, no, uh, no. Someone from RBA is, is who's authorized to confirm that. Right. I agree. I agree. Um, uh, I, I guess the, the other question is also related. Are third-party processes covered under this? Uh, are not covered under that, this directive? Uh, so, you want to quickly attempt that, uh, Rajiv? Is it the same aligned with the same uh, point that you mentioned? Yeah, it, it is. It is as you mentioned. Like you know, RBA in this direction it also says that uh, the regulated entity should have a full oversight on the third-party service providers, uh, which which though they did not directly say that it applies to the third parties. And if you read between the lines, it it says that uh, you know the regulated entities were responsible for uh, for their full business, uh, which are you know some part of is managed by the third-party entities. Agreed. Uh, now that I've got you, I'll probably uh, come back to the question that I had is, uh, you know, is more in terms of uh, redaction of customer information, account numbers. I think uh, there is some uh, point and point 32 uh, in the RBI directive, which says that, uh, you know, regulated entities shall redact mask customer information, such as account numbers, card numbers, and other sensitive information when transmitted via SMS or email. So is there a prescribed redaction methodology what is accepted what's your take on it yeah the, the, the you know, a, i would say it, it's a good question <laughs> <laughs> i cannot really talk about uh, what methodology that the they should be you know using it was not clearly coming out but um, right. yeah I'll, I'll i'll give you my perspective at a very high level um, uh, right. if you just to uh, we'll take a step back and give you a background on on the fraud trends right so why we are insisting on all the controls because we wanted to protect the data not necessarily to be only the card data the the pi data of the consumers which is also critical right so data is the new oil of the criminals are after this uh, no no and, and targeting the companies who are storing the data or handling the data so it is important that uh, no, we uh, no, secure this data in some way uh, by either encrypting it or tokenizing it or 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 masking it or you know or, or doing you know the other things by taking out the sensitive data from you know, from the day to day business or from the from the from their operation side of it. Um, it, it 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 is a good guideline, but how do we do it on on, on taking this out uh, is something it just operationally we have to study and. Uh, yeah, so so that's that's my perspective. I cannot really comment on what methodology they should be using in taking the data out, sensitive data out from the systems. Uh, is, is it really viable in taking all the data out, and uh, no, no, will it impact the consumer experience as well? That is also something we need to know, keep in mind. So so that's that's my perspective. So again, that uh, no, we 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 may have to get further you know information on how RBA wanted uh, the regulated entities to. To implement this, so that is some area where the regulated entities may have to get some uh, no additional information from RBI. Perfect, and I agree. Uh, so, so I think my my two cents is this could get uh, ultimately it is uh, this is nothing but a risk management framework. Um, so I believe organizations should uh, 
you know at the end of the day apply what risks uh, you know uh, can have you know what are the various risks that can happen uh, and then accordingly uh, uh, think through this process and then uh, find out what 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 what's the best reduction uh, process they should follow uh, great so moving forward um, uh, you know lots of questions again but I i'm just making sure that we cover all the essentials here um, uh, yogesh uh, you 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 know obviously you uh, you know you do a lot of forensic investigations right and you, you're a global pfi um, trying it trying to see investigations and uh, so what is the what i what gaps are you currently seeing in forensic investigations which uh, which is being covered um, you know which you which you see having been covered in terms of incident response. I think there's on point 40, which talks about incident response. Sure. Uh, the uh, the first point which I would uh, like to highlight uh, uh, highlight is uh, regarding the well-defined incident response plan procedures. The, uh, the, all, the what we see in uh, basically all the entities or whatever cases which we have handled. Uh, though they had, say, a few of them had the incident response plan as well, but it was not documented well. It it was just a high-level statement documents on a very big uh, procedures mentioned, and uh, uh, say the teams are not trained as well. Uh, you know, if if any incident happened, what what should be the procedure? Whom they should contact? What is the time frame for that, etc. It, it's just for the team's sake, uh, which which I personally felt. That's my opinion. Uh, the main, uh, for any incident, having an exhaustive incident response uh, plan procedure is very well required. If you have a well-documented plan, you can easily respond to an incident. Now, uh, talking from the, uh, you know, what we have seen in the field, uh, because this was not documented or say the members who are handling this are not trained. They, are, they don't know how to handle these incidents. Uh, what steps should be taken? What are the critical things they should do? Like, for example, if any system is identified as compromised or say it is performing uh, sus uh, suspicious activity, we have seen that, uh, you know, they have just turned off the system altogether, which has led to, you know, uh, uh, now in the industry, many attacker use, uh, you know, fileless malware based concept where your malware only resides in memory, nowhere else. So if, if a system is infected with a malware, it would be just on the memory. And as soon as you turn it off, it, it just vanishes. It just goes off. Yeah. So those kind of artifacts are actually destroyed. And, uh, you know, uh, we cannot analyze it further from the, uh, the perspective of what it was actually uh, designed to do. Also, in certain cases, we have seen that, you know, if they have identified the malware or any suspicious activity, they just go ahead and delete it. Uh, so, uh, which has, uh, uh, due to which, you know, we we have not uh, been able to analyze like what exactly it was doing with which channels it was communicating. That information is very crucial to identify the rest compromised system in the environment instead of uh, going on a, you know, uh, finding a needle in a haystack, right? If we have these kind of data, we can uh, analyze it and pinpoint on the system other systems which were actually inf infected with the same thing or might be tied with the activity. So I guess there is a gap in uh, you know uh, uh, how to handle the incident, uh, what data should be collected, etc. And also we have seen that uh, you know the uh, after incident occurs, what data should be collected uh, that is not done. Secondly, uh, they take a lot of time. Uh, so there is a time gap from say identification to notification to the senior management. First people uh, as a human behavior, right? So first people try to handle at their own level. They don't report it directly following the incident response procedure. And then it goes to the management. Then based on the management approvals and et cetera, then they go for, a, you know, so that, that time span which they are spending, it's quite huge. And uh, in certain scenario, we have even seen that, you know, due to the time spent and their log retention period. Uh, so say on the system, they are retaining log for five to 10 days. They have already exhausted that period, and now there is no traces of the uh, incident or the log on the system altogether. So they have lost those critical things. So uh, talking again from the uh, forensic, uh, uh, when when we say that you know, are they forensic ready? Uh, have they configured their system to store all the logs uh, required for the incident handling? Have they done a proper incident planning, etc.? So that are very critical factor which should be considered. Uh, uh, not the uh, 
we we also cannot ignore the last piece which is the users uh, recently we have seen a lot of cases where you know especially due to the covid situation all of us are working from home and all uh, there was certain rise and uh, you know people were not accustomed to working from home kind of environment and we have seen that you know a lot of phishing mails coming in uh, the user system getting compromised and which has led to the actual compromise of the complete infrastructure the ingress point was user system uh, based on the user system compromise the intruder was able to perform the lateral movements as well so uh, you know training the users on reporting the incident how uh, or you know on the basic hygiene as well is very critical and that we still see missing in the cases which we have investigated we have even seen administrators performing such issues so uh, uh, that is one thing which uh, uh, which we should also focus on along with the uh, you know having a well documented incident response excellent uh, i think uh, anyone else wants to add uh, nitin uh, any other panelists wants to add to whatever yogesh mentioned uh, from the incident response standpoint i think uh, pci has a very beautiful document uh, that talks about uh, managing the data breaches so i think uh, i just shared with the uh, with maruti to share with the audience i think they should definitely look that document i think it will definitely help them uh, if they come across something uh, like that to you know cope up with the situation yeah just to add to that i think one of the key things that we keep telling is that uh, these incidents um, even uh, you know uh, can happen to anyone and so we need to be we need to be able to uh, encourage that culture where people should report this a uh, lot faster so that we can all act together to make sure that uh, we are able to take necessary containment steps, uh, you know, in a timely manner. Uh, moving forward, um, you know, um, uh, uh, so so this is for Rajiv. Um, uh, you know, reconciliation systems, right? So we've seen uh, uh, multiple RTGS frauds, SWIFT frauds uh, come up, and then you being from the fraud standpoint, uh, you know, um, uh, is this uh, you know point forty one covers a little bit on those reconciliation mechanisms. Uh, because we've seen frauds happen because uh, you know don't come to light and and then after a long period of time they do some reconciliation uh, and then they figure out hey they, there is there has been a compromise uh, do you do you, i with the, with the point 41 of the uh, of the master direction uh, you know do you think that addresses some of those concerns Rajiv? Sure. I yeah yeah I, I I believe it may address some of the you know the concerns and uh, trends that we are seeing. Uh, so, but I, I cannot fully talk about the the reconciliation related to Swift or or uh, or or, or, or yeah. yeah RTGS. Yeah, I but I can give you my perspective uh, from sure. a from a payment transaction perspective and what type of trends that we are seeing and uh, and how reconciliation can help. I can give you an example like where we have seen the recent uh, you know, times where the criminals are are taking over the you know some of the vulnerable merchants network to process uh, fraudulent refund transactions to the mule accounts and uh, bit, what what we have seen here uh, is as a, a lack of control in the reconciliation process so that led to the activity you know, you know continuing for a longer time and increased the significant you know, losses or increase the losses for the the impacted entities so so this is the same thing we have seen in an atm cash out situation as well as one of the the largest and, and fastest growing threat that targets the uh, financial institutions particularly the switch networks of the financial institutions so it it, it is critical i believe it address uh, you know some of the you know threats that we have seen i believe it was written based on the experience uh, that our learnings from the the investigations uh, uh, you know, that RBI has conducted or, or the learnings that the RBI has gained from the investigations conducted on the incidents reported uh, in India. Uh, yeah, so um, yeah, it, it, it is critical and it is, an, it is one of the area where we, we do see vulnerabilities that has been exploited by the criminals, Excellent. which resulted in a significant you know, financial loss. The losses are very, very significant. It's not like, not one or two transactions or or, or or few hundred thousand. It's the losses that we have seen in the past incidents are in millions, right. millions of USD. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah, excellent point. And I think uh, this uh, reconciliation mechanism, which uh, RBI says 41, it says uh, not later than 24 hours from the time of settlement reconciliation framework. So I, I think 
to a large extent they have made an attempt to make sure that uh, those kinds of concerns are taken care of. so uh, excellent uh, perspective uh, rajiv there so one question taking from the audience i think uh, there's one question which is uh, uh, i think uh, is from rajesh is how to build uh, and ensure trust on third parties when scans are done on authenticated mode so yogesh uh, is there a way for us to know uh, uh, uh you know if if someone is producing a vulnerability assessment report uh is, how do you know whether it's a authenticated mode or not they have done it especially if you if it is done if your third party provider uh is not uh, you know is there a way to know that in the reports uh so uh basically from the tool definitely we can see that uh from the uh the tools which are they're using to run the uh scans uh the in the output we can see whether the uh, scans was done using uh authenticated mode what credentials was used etc on the system level when it comes to the report perspective from the client's side suppose their third party has done the scan and then uh, you know they have just reported the vulnerabilities and uh, you know if they want to just validate because all the report would be custom uh, reporting template right it won't be from directly from the tools so uh, uh, in that way uh, we'll have to check for the due diligence and uh, say uh, on the system records also we can do uh, sample checks on uh, you know based on the event log definitely our event logs would be generated for what type of activity has occurred in the system so event log or system audit logs would definitely reflect certain activities being carried out and uh, then resting we need to uh, perform what i think is from the due diligence perspective as well sure and i think um, uh, you know prakash uh, uh, kumar ranjan i think he's clarified that uh, says that it is not new for authenticated scan it was already mentioned in the rbi uh, gkc guidelines in 2011 so okay so that's information for me thanks prakash for pointing it out um moving forward uh, i think um, on point 56 yeah, and 6 yeah sorry go ahead rajesh yeah there's some just just on that all, all, all the guidelines that you're seeing in the master direction are not all are new so what they did is okay. they've kind of you know combined everything and put it as a master circular i believe they have, did mention that uh, the effective date for or some of these uh, guidelines are 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 different and because these are not new guidelines these are announced you know some of them are announced in the past and it has been already effective yeah excellent excellent fantastic i, I think that gives a very good uh, perspective to things on on point uh, 56 to 66 i, I think uh, uh, there's a lot on mobile application security controls right uh, <clears throat> so so you know moving forward just raising up a little since we uh, we catching up on time because we got a lot of good questions as well uh, on mobile application security controls uh, so this is to yogesh what's your take uh, i think um, you know in the past uh, you know i i know that you were leading the mobile application security practice for cisa right so so you 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 can comment on that so mobile uh, payment application security controls what's your uh, uh, take and you know does that and specifically you know points i think there's a question also uh, uh, which says uh, how does the designing of anti malware capability it is to mobile applications you know how does that work do you have any take or you know what's the what's your what's your take on it sure uh, so uh, looking at the uh, directives i mean the controls which are mentioned over here so uh, we have we have seen that in uh, past implemented by few uh, uh, you know few uh, leaders in the market, uh, but not all of those was implemented. Uh, bits and pieces being implemented. Looking at these controls, uh, uh, it 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 uh, looks good. Or, or say from the security perspective, this is going to bring in uh, uh, you know uh, uh, more to the table. Now, when when we see about the investigation which we had, even uh, when I from those perspective, uh, there were um, issues or uh, say the uh, mobile application APIs were exploited uh, with say SQL kind of vulnerabilities as well. Uh, you know, uh, which which usually we uh, you know all the mobile vendors uh, they go with this mindset that you know always the traffic would be coming from the mobile device. Uh, that is one of the mindset which we have seen in the past. Uh, which is changing. Uh, I, I hope uh, all vendors would, uh, you know, implement it accordingly and, uh, you know, get to the position that, you know, traffic can come from anywhere because it's not just your mobile application uh, who is sending out the traffic. 
the traffic can be intercepted any which way and can be uh, tampered with. Uh, also, we have seen that you know the uh, they expect the data would be always in a particular request format itself, which which has actually led to you know uh, the other attack surface to occur, like you know uh, being uh, exploited using SQL injections. And apart from that, we have also seen uh, vulnerabilities related to uh, you know authenticated, uh, I mean uh, authorization or or say business logic flaws. We have seen the case where you know a business logic flaw was exploited, which due to which uh, there was transactions carried out, a balance transfer uh, carried out. You can say fund transfer was carried out from one account to another account where there was no balance in the sent account altogether, but the transaction went through, and which has caused crores of rupees. Yeah. Uh, also, we have seen uh, that you know it, because of improper authorization. Or say linking of the card itself, or say account data itself, uh, the intruder or say attacker was able to, uh, you know, dump the complete data of the bank altogether. Of all the customer records was available just by changing the customer IDs. To uh, it was just a small bug in the application, but again, all intruder needs needs is a one bug or one exploitable vulnerability which he can exploit and gain access of the complete data. Or the complete environment as well, which we have seen in the past. So uh, these controls would definitely help uh, in uh, reducing the attack surfaces. Um, uh, that that would I take along with the application security controls, which I mentioned in the early uh, in this document, conducting a secure code review and test activities that that should uncover such vulnerabilities as well, and uh, we should uh, move towards secure uh, implementation. Lastly, I would uh, like to also touch upon the uh, hard-coded keys and the credentials. We have also seen the breaches related to them as well, uh, where uh, you know, uh, not just talking from the mobile side, back talking about the backend side as well. Uh, we have seen that uh, you know uh, the development companies or say the uh, the companies who are uh, developing these kind of application. They have a lot, large team, right? And due to this COVID situation, all are working from home. So we see uh, an offline copies of being kept, right? And these copies generally have the hard coded credentials or anything of that sort, uh, even for say testing or say production. So uh, there is possible leakage from uh, that side as well, which we should also consider. Uh, you know how the architecture is, where we are exposing the code, uh, what can be uh, you know taken and what can be misused. Lastly, the code uh, of a technique which is mentioned is uh, really great. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And sorry to cut you there. Uh, I, I think, uh, yeah, the code obfuscation, you want to just quickly complete that point, uh, Yogesh? Yeah, I think it was interesting. Sure. So the code obfuscation uh, is really necessary and uh, it's it's covered. So we have seen uh, many uh, many companies already implemented code obfuscation. Uh, that uh, that uh, reduces the chance of say reverse engineering and uh, understanding the code completely. Though there are certain tools uh, uh, which which can uh, deobfuscate the code as well. But, but again, it makes it uh, difficult. And also, uh, if we implement it properly, it might not be completely decoded as well. So that would help the uh, uh, you know help on preventing uh, end user to read the business logic, how the application is operating, etc. Which could, uh, which could, you know, minimize the uh, API hooking and all, or uh, you know, exploitation of the, uh, say, application itself on the front end perspective. Sure. So while we are at it, uh, while we are, uh, uh, this one, uh, you know, uh, halfway through or more than halfway through in this uh, panel, uh, I think it's qu good time to pick our, pick our uh, uh, pull up our second poll question. Uh, Ashwini, do you want to run the second poll question? Just to make sure that we've got everyone hooked sure, on to the sure. webinar. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think very, very interesting questions and perspective. Uh, yeah. So we'll quickly give uh, uh, 30 seconds for everyone to vote. Uh, so, so some things for your self introspection. Do you have a well documented incident response plan and forensic investigator on standby? So, do you have a proper incident response so that um, someone um, uh, you know can help in terms of when you have a when you report an incident. Ideally, uh, within 48 hours, uh, you would need to uh, uh, engage a forensic investigator, uh, so to speak. But yeah, so do you have one in plan? 
20 seconds left. Yeah. Yeah. And this is anonymous poll, so you can go ahead and give it. We are not. Uh, this is just to get a sense of uh, we as a community, where do we stand? Okay. I think you can close. I think people can see the results, right? Uh, so we are publishing the results, right? Uh, Great. So we've got about so just for everyone's benefit, we've got 67% uh, 67 who say that they have a well documented forensic investigation uh, incident response plan and forensic investigation stand that. So that's that's good to know. Um, so so moving forward, um, the 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 next question we've got is uh, uh, more in terms of for Nitin. I think uh, uh, we we're moving to card payment security now. So Nitin. Uh, It'll be good to get your perspective. Uh, so we've got uh, PCF pin being mentioned uh, very clearly. Uh, so uh, you know, so what's your take? I think PCI pin. Uh, how do you see changing uh, this? Changing the adoption of PCI pin standards because one of the key things for adoption of PCI pin is uh, uh, as a standard has been you know there's not too much compliance push for PCI pin in the past. Uh, not sufficient, I would say. There has been some, uh, you know, some uh, uh, schemes which have pushed for PCI pin, but largely we we don't see so much of a compliance mandate coming on PCI pin. But with this RBI uh, master direction, uh, what's your take on PCI pin? I mean, uh, I know you can't answer from compliance standpoint, but from the standard standpoint, what is what's your take? Now, I think it's a good uh, it's a good move. I think I would uh, I would say, but uh, before I I said, you know, at the, at the same time, you know, the uh, the pin security requirements you know basically are being uh, determined by the individual payment brands and uh, whether the organization is required to go undergo an assessment against the pin security so i think that's one thing and i think anyone who is uh, looking up looking for the pin security requirements to accomplish i think they should contact the payment brands directly for uh, any information pertaining to the compliance programs now interestingly uh, PCI also is working very aggressively on on improving the standards and improvising on the standards and we recently on 12th of March published the version 3.1 of the pin security standard so now this revision minor revision to the pin, PCI pin security requirements and testing processes uh, you know which is also known as the PCI pin security standards version 3.1 of this which includes the clarifications and updates previously released via FAQs, you know, which during the COVID we have been doing that and bulletins and it also incorporates the stakeholder feedback and comments received via the formal RFC process. So for the audience interest, what is PIN security requirements are and what is the testing procedures? I'll just quickly in a, a quick uh, 30 seconds, I will try to brief them. So the PIN data, you know, that provides an authentication method uh, to help protect uh, the payments from fraudulent use. The PIN uh, PCI pin security standards uh, here, here that provides the require such provides requirements and testing procedures for secure management uh, processing and transmission of the pin data at ATMs and unattended and un uh, attended and unattended point of sale uh, terminals. So, so this is what the pin security requirements and testing procedures are meant for. Now, there are certain notable changes that have come uh, with the PCI pin security requirements. One is the incorporation of the revised effective dates of the key block implementation that uh, we published uh, last year in july and the revision of these dates was in response to the stakeholders feedback around because of the covid 19 impact has an uh, has on the implementation efforts second uh, uh, notable change that came in the in the version 3.1 is the incorporation of previously announced revision to the dates and scope of uh, for implementing the uh, encrypted key injections injection uh, and the third is suspension of the effective dates for entities to support ISO format for uh, four pin blocks. And uh, uh, also we have a clarification for uh, PCI approved HSNs that uh, the approvals may be contingent on being deployed in the controlled environments or more robust secure environments as defined under ISO uh, 134912 uh, and in the device uh, of the PCI HSM security policy. So. Uh, Hey, that's what has come as part of the PCI uh, uh, PCI pin version 3.1 and uh, Just for the audience interest again who can do all these uh, these audits and certifications are the qualified pin assessors uh, Which we call them as a QPAs are qualified I'm sure CISA is also one of the QPAs and uh, and they're trained by the PCI SSC to perform the independent assessments of environments where the pin are processed against the pin security requirements and in accordance to the QPA program guide. 
so it, in nutshell what i'll try to say is that it's a good move but at the same time the in uh, the whoever has to undergo this pci pin uh, pci pin security requirements uh, they have to reach out to their individual payment brands to define uh, you know whether they need to do it and and you know they have to check with the compliance perspective of the payment networks hope sure. that answers you. yes nitin you uh, you got it uh, and and yogesh you are a qpa um, so uh, what's your pci pin take um, how do you think uh, this one so so with this thing do you see more uh, adoption of pci pin standards does it will it help the ecosystem uh yes definitely uh darshan uh, I'll, I'll talk from the standpoint of the key management which is the uh you know which is not incorporated in most of the organization so implementing a proper key management procedures and same can be implemented for all type of keys which are present in the environment if we can take the pcpn standard and implement it across that is going to help a lot and will help us in securing all the data uh, because uh data is secure till your key is secure right if the key is compromised your complete data is also compromised that can be decrypted so the key management uh, is very well documented in the standard starting from say complete key life cycle that is key generation storage distribution so that provides a clear cut guidance as well as the, you know the uh, steps how it should be implemented how it should be followed so that is the best thing which i like about that uh, particular standard and uh, would like to see the organization implementing across whether uh, you know they are following uh, they they the pin is applicable to them or not at least they can have that piece uh, related to the key management device management taken and incorporate that uh, if in any scenarios i i'm sure all environment would have keys uh, irrespective uh, they must be encrypting decrypting certain data so that can be uh, utilized excellent yeah so my one one input that be you know i've been part of the uh, pci uh, pin standards in the initial years as well so one of the key things that i hope to see uh, as as a as a uh, as a as a player in the ecosystem is one of the this pci pin standards being adopted even in the issuing side uh, largely it is uh, the all the compliances are driven on the acquiring side but i think uh, many of the banks and organizations can still use this standard even if they don't want to go for audits or um you know I, i think if you want to improve your own security posture you can take, still take the pci pin standards and then uh, implement it on the issuing side because uh, it it would enhance your security posture uh, dramatically great so if you've got rajesh uh, rajesh had a hard stop but uh, rajesh uh, logging of hsm 0.70 i'm jumping into 0.70 if you are still there maybe we'll take your uh, you know your your uh, take on pci hsm uh you know for, for the first time i i it actually very good points once again i i think uh, uh, you know from uh, i think as you as uh, rajiv mentioned uh, i think the regulators also learned a lot from the breaches that have happened and hence they have said even logging of pci hsm uh it's a good point uh, but uh, do you see organizations doing it rajesh do you see that is being practiced or how do you, how do you see this happening so now um, you know so now this is basically you know now we have to see whether now because uh, each of these loggings will actually will impact the performance of your hsm mri so we now we have to look at it i think uh, it maybe uh, we might have to test first and see how exactly it's impact the performance of the uh, hsm itself and then take a call on it uh just for your so now just for your info am i right so usually most of the hsms doesn't have by default enabled the logging is not enabled so you have to enable it and then there are specific role you have to create it um in hsm to enable that and then um, you know there is a, a whole rotation log rotation process has to be followed to ensure that uh, you copy that log on the local file system and then look at it uh, those logs and remove it from a memory correct so that whole process also has to be followed but having said this uh, they have uh, not only the logging they have covered the again uh, the in the hsm they have covered um, specifically on the you know the uh, because hsm becomes a single point of failure as well so they are specifically talking about um, clustering on high availability of the hsms as well they are talking about the overall access management of that and then printing of the cards has to be directly through the hsm so i'm not sure practically how exactly because printing of the cards is usually outsourced in the banks am i right so uh, i'm not sure how exactly that uh that bit also will uh, you, you uh, will play but i think yeah the uh, in a, as an intent it is 
all these are uh, extremely good from a security point of view if we enable it at least half of them in them as well also i think we will definitely will be in a much better and secure environment than what the type of attacks especially hsm related attacks which we saw in last couple of years uh, in india as well excellent yeah thanks for that perspective rajesh uh, so uh, we are just about um, 15 minutes away from closing so i just um, you know uh, wrap up my points and then um, get into only because we see a hell lot of questions coming up and pouring here so we want to make sure that we cover as much as we can and for those of you who we cannot answer for some reason we'll make it a point to come back to you uh, we can go back to the panelists and then get their view points but uh, so we'll but we'll make sure that we cover last point from um, uh, you know once again mixing questions from uh, i mean uh, questions from uh, uh, the panel that i had was on the card scanning tools right so this is for nitin um, so uh, why do um, organization uh, you know one of the key things and it's very heartening to note that darbi has actually come out very clearly about you know the fact that you need to do discovery of da- card data within the environment and that's good it's a good move uh, considering the fact uh, there are so many uh, uh, you know uh, compromises that happen because of that but uh, so why one challenge that we always see is why do organizations only uh, scan their already defined pci scope and not the entire scope environment uh, you know what's your take on that yeah i think uh, darshan see if you have to look at uh, from the point of card data discovery i think uh, even the pci requirements uh, requirement 3.1 specifically talks about that you need to identify your your systems where you are uh, storing the payment card data and you have to identify and and basically you have to uh, make sure that you use your manual or automatic process automatic process to identify where you are all having the stored data in the systems but interestingly uh, what i would say is that i think as a press practice you know when you talk about when we talked about the risk assessment and you uh, you know we were talking about having a business processes be taken into consideration of doing a proper risk assessment within an organization i think it's become very crucial and important that organizations should understand uh, we need to identify you know we need to identify the day, the the storage points today and make sure that we are able to secure the payment data and pci always says that you know if you do not need the data you don't store it also right it's very very clear but at the same time if you do not identify where the card holder data is residing it will be very very difficult for us to identify uh, or probably say that you know we are we are we are able to implement the requirements with the right intent right so so it's important that you expand the horizon and see you know wherever you think of uh, you know is, uh, think of that the card holder data is getting stored uh you know we should identify those storage points and make sure that we uh we basically uh, delete them you know when we don't, when we don't, we really do not need the data to be be there in those particular systems so but nutshell if you do not need it do not store it so yogesh uh, you uh, as a forensic investigator uh, what have you been seeing and what should organizations do what's your take on you know on on scanning for card data sure so uh uh talking from the forensic investigation of uh, say small merchants to even the big banks when when we talk about uh, e-commerce web or uh, those kind of thing we have come across the cases where uh, the client has directly said that no they don't have any card data in their moment and while doing our investigation they uh, all all have said that you know they just receive the data and they just uh, passed on to the you know payment gateway or payment processor for further processing they don't store anything altogether they don't have any functionality of tokenization safe card etc but while our investigation because uh, the cpp alert was raised uh, i mean the alert incident alert is raised uh, during our investigation we identified that the customer actually was storing the card data though it was uh, not intended but by mistake uh, due to their programming uh, uh, issue they were actually retaining the card data and that card data was compromised at the end of day and because it uh, the client was unaware of such storage no action was taken on those data neither it was protected nor the uh, sensitive data was redacted or removed uh, from the system as well when we talk about the banking customers as well uh, the environment is pretty huge and the card data can reside almost anywhere in the environment which especially in the card division uh, we have seen that you know uh, the card uh, you know uh, those banks also getting a breach uh, just because you know the card data was identified on the system which was not in the pci scope they have not covered that as part of uh, their pci scope and that was not 
you know, the controls which are intended were not implemented and the intruder was able to get the low-lying fruit uh, and, you know, just take that uh, our data out. Uh, so again, it depends upon if, if they are aware uh, of the storage, where it is stored. So they can take the appropriate action on those things. And, you know, uh, maybe they, if they don't want to store it, they can just remove it. Uh, uh, you know, if if they actually need it, then protect the data into the PCI scope and, uh, you know, uh, uh, take necessary actions. So one, one the crucial point would be that, you know, identification of the data and what data is stored in the environment is very crucial so that essential controls, security around it can be implemented so that, uh, you know, uh, in the breach, even if uh, your environment is uh, breached by any, uh, you know, unauthorized party, they are not able to get hands on these uh, crucial or sensitive data. They can be stopped before they reach to that point. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So that's one of the key things that I keep uh, advocating as well is uh, don't scan on just only your PCI scope because that's where potentially you you know, but what you what you want to actually know from scanning uh, is where you don't know that there is card data or sensitive data, right? So, so that's one thing. Great. So, uh, you know, we've answered a few questions from the panel. We've answered questions that we had, um, uh, you know, at least I've kind of covered. We've got a few uh, 10 minutes left. So we'll try to uh, see what are the rest of the questions we have got and try to answer them. Um, and I'll go as per the sequence here. Uh, so, so this is for Rajiv. I think RBI has certain guidance on transaction monitoring. Uh, what more is expected from uh, uh, from banks uh, you know this is a question uh, you, you, do you think you can you have an answer for that uh, uh, rajiv yeah so sure question, um, yeah. do you want me to repeat the question sure. yes please yeah so rbi has given certain guidance on transaction monitoring what more is expected from banks so that's the quick question yeah uh, I think if I have to simply answer this, the bank has to follow a multi-layer approach uh, and have controls at multiple layers uh, um, uh, so that if one system is compromised, the controls that you have placed in another system uh, now will help you to prevent any large-scale attacks. Uh, it is also kind of covered in the RBA guidelines. Uh, yeah, but but uh, no, following a multi-layer approach uh, no, for fraud monitoring will be uh, will will help uh, no, in, in in mitigating uh, no, the, the threats that we are seeing today. Um, in addition, adapting the highly secure technology, um, it may be uh, no, EMB 3DS or or, or no, uh, EMB implementation no, for all your channels uh, no, may help. Um, that's not specifically on a transaction monitoring perspective, but on, on securing the transaction itself is very critical. So yeah, that's that's my view on on monitoring. Uh, to be very specific on having controls at multiple layers is very critical. Agree. I think one, uh, the next is, uh, I think I'm just taking, uh, in terms of points which we have not covered, I see a lots of questions coming which we've already covered. Um, the, so one comment by Alexander uh, is, uh, the RBI should also consider PII as against cardholder data. So I, I guess it's a comment. Which is good, uh, you know. I agree that we should cover, uh, but uh, but I mean, knowing RBI, RBI's mandate is largely financial. So PII, I think, uh, from an Indian standpoint, anyway, we know that the PDP is getting tabled. Uh, hopefully, so it should go through this time. <laughs> um, uh, the one other question is, I think this regulation brings all PCI DS standards to uh, uh, once again by Rajesh uh, and few more granular additions to regular entity. Uh, customer data move uh, further from cardholder data. Yeah, so I think that's a comment as well. Uh, so uh, the other question that is being asked is, uh, do you think SWIFT payments are covered in this circular? Um, so uh, anyone wants to uh, uh, talk about it? Uh, any any take on it whether SWIFT is covered by RBI circular? Any panelist wants to take it? Okay, so my uh, my thing is, uh, I believe so. Uh, this is my take. Uh, so, Yogesh, do you want to, do you think it, because I think it covers all digital payments, though there's card data security covered separately, but I believe uh, it, it does cover digital, all digital payment modes. Uh, uh, is, is that your interpretation as well, Yogesh? Uh, yeah, yeah, Darshan. So, it, it, uh, when we, uh, just going through the, uh, uh, 
this one I, it looks like uh, it it only covers i mean all the payment modes are covered basically uh, the in more depth it is defined about the internet banking mobile banking atm and those channels uh, not specifically on uh, say rtgs and nift and uh, uh, swift uh, neft and swift so uh, but yeah. ultimately there are the modes of channel which can be initiated uh, from the banking uh, channels uh, i mean internet banking and other channels so that that should be covered as per my uh, reading of that yeah and I, I and i subscribe to that view i think they can be, they could be more clarity uh, we also I, I think it would be more clarity on other digital um, payment but I, I i be you know overall the framework i think addresses if you see the master circle it says digital payments it does not say only one mode of payment um, so so i believe it should cover but having said that there's no separate call out for say a upi or for a swift and you know those kinds of things but i i think it does there's so lots of questions so i, I kind of trying to see as much as we can but as i mentioned uh, uh, please feel uh, you know we will make sure that we answer every question in case we have not um, been able to do that in this panel uh, later on um, so we've got just uh, seeing if we've got any other questions that we need to we can cover up um, so there's some question on p2p uh, uh nathan do you want to quickly answer does this what does it mean for p2p at this point in time does p2p standard also need to be implemented uh, there's a question around p2p uh, do, you, do you see p2p uh, coming into vogue now uh, and, and i think push, uh, i think you see whatever the standards you know the standards are always good to uh, to you know secure the payment data any which way anyway and the point is that any anything that is uh, related to the adoption of this standard, I think it has to go to the uh, 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 to the payment branch. And you know, probably the, they are the one who run the compliance programs on various standards. So as a PCI, we largely focus only on the development of the standards. So uh, so I think anyone who is looking for uh, the, uh, the adoption or the implementation of the PCI point-to-point -point encryption standard, I think they should definitely get in touch with the payment net branch their respective payment branch and i think they should have an answer to that question you know how the adoption should go away excellent i think we are close to our time we've tried our best to answer all the questions that came by very good questions i think we've got a very interactive uh, uh, set of uh, participants today um uh, ashwini do you want to really quickly run the third poll uh, just to make sure that we are on the same page and our, our, our feedback uh, poll uh, and then uh, we can uh, expect everyone to give some uh, parting comments. Okay, so this is the third poll that we are running. Do you, um, so people can say, do you scan for card data uh, only for your PCS scope or you scan beyond PCS scope? How many of you uh, scan uh, where, where you know your card data is or no, you don't scan as we don't store card data. Uh, so quickly give 30 seconds for people to complete this poll and then we, wrap up the session right. okay so Ashwini you want to quickly publish the close the poll okay all right so this is the poll result I think 32 percent say yes we can we scan only PCI scope so I, I think uh, maybe for all of you who've done that uh, maybe we should look beyond PCI scope uh, so for those of you who are doing scanning beyond your PCS scope, very good. I, I think that will give you a lot of insight. Uh, for those of you who are not scanning, uh, it may be still worthwhile uh, to look at it uh, and, uh, you know, and and make sure that you scan uh, and, and get some perspective. And even if you don't, if you think you are not storing card data, still it's worthwhile to scan. Yeah. Uh, so from a risk management standpoint. So with that, uh, I think we are uh, close to our session. Uh, this has been a fantastic and a highly interactive uh, panel discussion. Um, quick uh, 30 second uh, uh, wrap up, uh, you know, a comment by all the panelists who are here on this call. Uh, so Nitin, you want to go first and then we give everyone uh, your wrap up comment. Positive. Yeah, yeah Nitin, I, I think I have an, so my, my opening comment and my wrap up comment is going to be the same. So it's a right time where the the industry, the stakeholders within the payment card industry should start investing on educating and getting trained themselves on the implementation of the standards. And I think that's the key that you know I would I would want to leave with the audience to think and 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 you know if they really want to 
contribute to the standards development they feel they are most welcome to join the council thanks nitin yogesh a uh, quick 30 seconds personally feel that uh, you know uh, it's it's not just the controls we should also ensure that these are implemented as per uh, uh, not just uh, just on the check mark check box check the box kind of concept but with the uh, you know uh, should be implemented thoroughly just to ensure that they are uh, you know they can actually uh, perform what they are intending to do and secure your environment basically we are looking forward to reduce the breach or say uh, if we cannot directly reduce it at least re reduce the attack surfaces so that we can focus on the dedicated or say advanced uh, kind of breach and take other necessary steps so that would be sure. my take yeah so security so implement it in through spirit yeah rajiv I think kind of agree with uh, what uh, Yokesh was saying. Uh, yes, we have uh, these great guidelines from the regulator. I think you know not only implementing it is one step. So and also following up, you know, and uh, you know, because security is a journey, it doesn't stop you know, after an implementation. I think you have to continuously monitor and ensure that uh, you are upgrading your controls based on the threats and and uh, trends that we are seeing. That is also equally critical. uh so i I'm, i'm positive about this direction and uh, hopefully uh, you know the participants uh, know, reviews and implements it to comply with the the local regulatory standards thanks rajiv excellent um so with that note i think uh, we are uh, we once again uh, thank you all for uh, joining this webinar um, uh, you know we it's our from cisa standpoint it's been our uh, effort to make sure that we are able to add value to the marketplace to the ecosystem by bringing uh, you know the uh, you know the different perspectives uh, to this uh, interpretation of the rbi's master direction so that's been our uh, effort uh, we look forward to getting your feedback Uh, on what sessions we should do from cisa standpoint um you know uh, being a part of the community uh, what is that we need to focus on uh, so we look forward to hear hear from you ashwini you have a feedback a quick feedback link we would like to hear how how this webinar was whether it was useful um, what would you like to do uh, so ashwini you want to quickly run a feedback poll for the session as soon as the session ends there is a feedback form that i request audience to take that uh, feedback and put your comments I'll also suggest uh, some topics that you are interested in and we would love to host that uh, session excellent uh, with that note uh, you know uh, we are signing off uh, thank you and have a great uh, rest of the week uh, and appreciate your time and hope it was useful have a good one thanks